Um, would you believe that texting is the uh, number one form of communication and the cultivator of connectedness, more so than email and more so than social media? So here's my story. Um, 160 characters and more. <laughs> I uprooted myself uh, from South Africa and uh, to pursue uh, graduate studies um, here in the States. And I left behind five brothers and sisters, uh, close cousins, family and friends. Um, these were people that I generally checked in with every day, uh, be it you know, for our indoor soccer tournaments or beach soccer, be it for tea breaks and, and so forth. I'm sure you do the same, um, and I did it with texting. Now, quite a few of my relatives and friends when I moved here, you know, dawned on me that how am I going to now communicate with them because they do not have computers and they do not have internet access. So my go-to means to communicate with them was via their mobile phones. My parents, they do not know how to use a computer, uh, but they do know how to use a mobile phone and they do know how to text. Um, while here, I meet a great amount of people to support me culturized to the United States, and they complete their studies in two years, and they leave. Now, amidst this anxiety of losing my friends, um, I also go through a separation, and I, you know, am feeling anxious about the fact that I won't be able to see my two boys every day of their lives. Um, amidst this, obviously, I'm yearning for support, and I can only reach out to my family and my friends via texting. Um, at this time, in South Africa, great technology developments allowed me to connect with my younger sister via my IM email chat tool. I could IM in my chat tool, and she could receive it as a text message for free, no charge for her receiving a text message. That's the model back home. And for her to reply, for me to receive it in my IM, uh, it would cost her less than one cent. So we'll be able to have this conversation um, at next to nothing. And what was great about that was that, yeah, email was fine, but it's asynchronous. Yeah, I have to wait for a response. There's a five-hour difference. Whereas with the texting, it was near synchronous real time. Now, this sense of connectedness that this provided me, um, be it in limited characters, provided me a great source of emotional sustenance. And it carried me through my doctoral studies and my dissertation. I felt sustained, but at the same time, I also noticed that I wasn't the only one that would get a smile on my face when I'm receiving a text message. Um, no, you know, this gleeful uh, sense of anticipation when you're waiting for one to come back. So this led me to believe that such a ubiquitous form of communication could definitely be utilized um, in an educational arena. I then developed a graduate course, two graduate courses actually, uh, making use of mobile phones for learning, M-learning. Uh, talking about what theories to think of, what are the practical pedagogical issues to consider. And amidst that, part of that research was comparing the landscape of mobile phone use, uh, both with the friends that I had lost and that I was communicating with via their phones, uh, from India, Pakistan, Argentina, the Philippines, um, to the USA. And five years ago, Texting was not the number one form of communication in the USA. Texting only really overtook voice communication, voice calling in 2007, the last quarter of 2007 here in the States. Whereas in the rest of the world, um, it was always the go-to means of communication. It's actually known as SMS um, in the rest of the world. Now, People obviously, you know, you, why do you get your phone? You get your phone to feel safe, you, you get your phone to feel secure, you, to 
feel connected. Um, and this goes way beyond just you know your micro coordinating when you're in the uh, store, in the one aisle, and you're texting. I'm in the second aisle. Do we need milk? <laughs> or um, I'm two blocks away. Be right there. We've seen that micro coordination coordination actually evolve into um, macro coordination, where nations, just recently, Tunisia, Egypt, nations can in actual fact macro coordinate around a single cause. And that's pretty powerful um, in this day and age. This has a powerful utility in our modern era. So while we converse with our immediate circle of friends and family and co-workers, at the same time, right from the palm of our hands, we can also communicate with the world. We comment on or respond to social media. Uh, we um, can comment on news feeds or even post to our microblogs. And, and in this way, we contribute, we stimulate, and we engage in a multimodal fashion, either via text or via photos or video. Now, we're obviously connecting with the rest of the world, but that is not just an electronic connection. It is a powerful form of social connectedness. Now, this concept, social connectedness, to define that, simply put, I'd use a Southern African ethical concept known as Ubuntu. And it basically roughly means people are people through other people. The uh, New Zealand government, their Ministry of Social Development, they see it as the relationships people have with others. And a uh, research workshop that I worked on, a multinational research workshop, we defined it as the uh, belongingness, the feelings of belongingness and relatedness to others. Now, to use electronic communication in our hands to foster this connectedness has really influenced our lives over recent years. Um, although texting is, is short, micro moments, if you string that over time, and sometimes you know, we catch ourselves reading previous text messages, we get a sense of inspiration, a sense of connection to that, takes us back in memory. Um, it, it really does support us emotionally. With texting, we also have this connected presence. You're not just traveling alone on the bus anymore or waiting in line alone anymore. You can reach out to other people. And you also have the sense of co-presence. You're not just watching the football game alone anymore. You can text updates to one another. Or when you're at a live concert and you're at a private party, you could be in two places at the same time. Now, another great example of this texting being reformulated and being uh, uh, utilized in a macro-coordinated way was in 2008 during the Obama campaign. For the first time, the people learned who the VP, the vice president candidate, was going to be via texting, not via the press. That's pretty powerful. The people weren't dependent on the press to give them that news. That went out to them directly. And so, so too, all around the world, we've seen different uh, use of these crowdsourcing tools via our phones. Uh, be it here in New York City, there's a new um, app where you can MMS uh, a pothole that might be a, that you spot in your neighborhood or a light that's out, send us your photo, we'll get to it eventually, we'll fix it. Um, or even in cities and other countries where you have crime reporting via text messaging. Uh, in Kenya, you had um, voting uh, inconsistencies that were being reported. That took place in the USA as well. And so in these instances, the mobile phone does not just connect people to one another or to individuals, it does connect them to a cause. And from my previous speaker, while Europeans and North Americans have accessed the internet for the first time via a computer, many Africans are in actual fact accessing the web via their mobile phones for the first time. So narrowing that digital chasm just ever so slightly via the mobile phone but at the same time, taking a lead, taking a lead in m-commerce, mobile commerce. Uh, one example that I'll give in terms of the mobile commerce is um, uh, something called m-pesa. Uh, pesa is a Swahili word, uh, means money. And so m-pesa allows you to transfer money 
uh, both locally and uh, to distant locations. You can send mo uh, money from the city to your mother in the rural areas. Um, you could also use it to buy a loaf of bread, and you could also pay your taxi fare. All this via simple SMS texting. Um, this has been uh, such a success, it's made its way all the way from East Africa to South Africa, Southern Africa, and it's being exported to the UK as well as to Afghanistan. Now, although we have this amazing, uh, you know, confluence of where you can uh, share your thoughts, make use of cognitive surplus and uh, contribute online via your phone, we still find that the educational world is lagging behind. We find that our um, that a whole new business, as an actual fact, been spawned by the ban. There's a New York City ban on schools. Uh, people, students bringing their mobile phones into schools. So what the students do, they actually um, pay bodega shop owners to store their phones for the school day. Whole new business. So while your politically elected representatives say, you know, you do not come to school to play games, um, or to text message, there are amazing amount of um, examples of how we can utilize the mobile phone um, for learn phonetics, um, language learning, science, uh, educational reinforcement of concepts. Our students can document their experiences if they are on a field trip, for example. They could post that somewhere, they could revisit that, they can reflect on it. And they could also look at one another's um, reflections. In that way, we could be encouraging divergent thinking and critical thinking where we're engendering um, the idea of multiple perspectives, that they could host multiple perspectives, not just their own. When it comes to science experiments, they can document uh, the experiments document the steps, compare the results, check for variables, check for um, variables in the documented footage. And we can also use it to encourage mobile activism and mobile journalism. Um, and for me, a personal delight is we can reinvigorate the idea of oral tradition, where we could use, ask our students to talk to their grandparents and get their take on historical accounts of the past. Now, one other area, a passion of mine, is uh, language learning, and the mobile phone uh, is a, can also be used to complement uh, computer-assisted learning as well as mobile-assisted um, in-class learning. Now, yes, we do have the mobile phone as distractions and disruptions, but I think we can't just look at it in terms of a binary, we can't just use a binary argument and say, you know, we should ban the mobile phones. I think it's a multi-layered complex issue and if informed properly, if informed by theory and practical pedagogy, we could incorporate it and we could in actual fact offer a rich immersive experience for our students. We also do not want to make the same mistake that, you know, e-learning, when the e-learning bandwagon came about, you know, everybody jumped on and just, if you put something in a PDF, that's now e-learning. With a phone, it's even more tricky because you have small screen real estate and you have small keys to input. Imagine you're asking your students to read a whole long uh, post that you might have given them. The eye strain. Think if you ask them to, to type an essay. The uh, thumb tendonitis. That they you'll get just from the texting. Now, obviously we do want to inform our repurposing for educational benefit from practical considerations and so forth. And while you're listening to me, a, a question that you might be sitting with is, how do I initiate a mobile phone um, idea in my environment, be it at school or professional development purposes? I'd say, number one, survey the, cons the, survey the landscape. Context is key. Context really matters. You have a uh, plethora of uh, mobile phones types, you have uh, different data plans, you have an amazing amount of limited texting, limited data plans and so forth, and not everybody has the same type of phone. And if in your city or your school, if there's a ban, 
you don't just have to stick to the school confines. Learning takes place outside of the school as well. And you could encourage your students to uh, do projects outside of school. Secondly, I think for me, curriculum and content is core. But at the same time, right now, it's also dynamic. Our students can contribute with their phones. They can contribute to the, to the content. Um, they're not passive receivers anymore, but active contributors. And they could be if you allow them to use their mobile phone in that way. Thirdly, collaboration comes natural, to them at least. It comes naturally to them, and you could definitely incorporate that. Our students, they share music, they share videos, they play, they share games, and they play even, they play on the, on the same phone, the same game. Um, so for them, it's a natural collaborative spirit. Use that. Incorporate it into your mobile phone learning initiative. And then a little cherry on top here for a richer immersive experience is that don't necessarily think of the mobile phone as a replacement tool. Think of it as being part of your utility belt that you could pull out and use for a specific context, for a specific task. And as texting is the number one form of communication, we can definitely take advantage of this. And I, want to I don't want to challenge you. Many people challenge you. I want to invite you. I, know, I want to invite you to the M-learning party. <laughs> and I'm going to say BYOD to the M-learning party. <laughs> Bring your own device. Thank you very much. <laughs>